Uh, but if you haven't been here over the last couple of weeks, we have been in a series titled Level Up. And the reason why I titled this series Level Up is because of a statement that Jesus made to his disciples before he went back into the kingdom of heaven. And many of you should know the scripture very well by now. But what did he say? Is that of Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus said to the disciples, he said, you will receive what? Come on, can we say that louder? You will receive what? Power. Power. You will level up when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And because of the Spirit of God living inside of you, you will become my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. But here's what I want to do today. I also want to show you two interesting facts about this statement you may have not known before. Okay. So the first fact is this. Jesus was telling the disciples, and this may sound crazy, but Jesus was saying, it is better that I go that I be at the right hand of the Father, because only the Spirit of God can come upon every believer all over the world at one time, meaning you were never alone. And we've dived through the scriptures already, and I showed you that Jesus had actually limited his Godhood privileges by being born as a human being. Let me show you again. It's in Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. It says, instead, he gave up his divine privileges. And he took the humble position of a slave, meaning he was born as a human being when he appeared in human form, meaning Jesus could only be at one place at one time with the disciples, okay, before the resurrection. And he was with them at this place and that time. And because of this, they really depended on him being right beside him. So Jesus is saying, listen, here's the good news. I'm going to be at the right hand of the Father. But no matter where you are in the world... The Spirit of God lives inside of you and can bring comfort and will lead you and will help you give answers to some of the hardest questions you have right now. Right now, let me ask you, are you nervous about a situation that's before you? Are you getting anxiety because you got to do something that's uncomfortable or go somewhere that you normally don't go to and it's, it kind of feels like you're alone? What Jesus is saying is that you will never be alone. The Spirit of God is living inside of you. And in those moments, I'm telling you, if you just take a second to breathe and say, Holy Spirit, be with me. Speak to me today. Help me to know that you are here. You will get a peace that can only come from above. And I'm telling you right now, watch God work. Watch God work through you in a miraculous way. Because what Jesus said fulfilled a prophecy out of the book of Joel. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29 says it like this. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit, God says, on all flesh. Now notice this. Every time the subject is about the Holy Spirit, there is power behind the Holy Spirit. Have you noticed that? Every time the Holy Spirit shows up, there's miracles that are happening. There's things that you can never do by your natural strength. So God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And because of that? Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions, even on the male and female servants. In those days, God says, I will pour out my spirit. No matter where you are in the world, the spirit of God is in you as a believer in Christ. But the second fact that Jesus was stating is this. Jesus was saying, not only is there power in your life, but he was saying it like this, there will be explosive power in your life. Because the word power here in Greek is actually dunamis. And dunamis in the English language, you know what that word is? Dynamite. So Jesus was saying it like this. You will receive extreme explosive power from the Holy Spirit, and he will change everything about you and the people around you, which means, here's the good news, the Holy Spirit can blast through any obstacle that stands in your way. Notice what I said here. Not you, but the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will give you strength, okay? God will move through you, but sometimes it's really hard to do, right? Sometimes there's situations and there's obstacles and we're praying to God, but God, how can you do something here? I'm seeing this relationship in my life, and it seems completely broken. God, can you really do something? Can you really restore that relationship? Or God, what if somebody I love, what if they're sick? Right? Because we read throughout the scriptures that there's a lot of healings that the disciples did, that Jesus would heal over and over again. In fact, we have been listing the gifts of the Holy Spirit. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is the gift of healing. Let me show you. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 7 and 9, this is a scripture we read last week about supernatural faith, but it states a spiritual gift 
is given to each of us to do what? To help each other. Part of the way we help each other is to have faith to believe what God is doing. And also it says this, verse nine, the same spirit gives great faith to another. And to someone else, the one spirit gives the gift of healing. Where does this power come from? Not from you, but from the spirit of God, according to the will of God, God can do the miraculous. Do you believe it though? Do you believe that we serve a supernatural God that is not limited to the natural world that we live in? That there are times where you don't know how to provide and God will give you an answer and he'll provide for you. That there are times that you're praying for a loved one, God, can you please just do something and heal them because this is out of my control. For the longest time, me and my wife, my family, we prayed over my daughter because that seemed out of our control and it was. And we prayed for healing even when it didn't look good. She had a tracheostomy, if you don't know her story, and there was one time they took the trach out. We thought she was healed, and then that night it was horrible. She almost died. She couldn't breathe. In fact, the hole that was in her throat because of the trach was starting to close up, and we were afraid they were going to have to perform the entire surgery over again. My wife was in the hospital room watching her pull all the cords and everything. But God said she would be healed. And we didn't understand at that moment, but we still believed in the word of God, even though we didn't see it around our circumstances. I don't know what you're dealing with today. I don't know what circumstances are in your life, but I'm asking you this question. Do you still believe we serve a supernatural God that can do what you can't on your own? Because this is what we see out of the book of Acts. And again, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Acts chapter three. But do you understand this is the very beginning of the church? The very beginning, Jesus just said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you with explosive power. What happens after that? They get together on the day of Pentecost in the upper room. Holy Spirit comes upon them. Then Peter, all of a sudden, he's so bold, starts proclaiming the gospel. 3,000 people get saved right away. Imagine, 3,000 people come to Christ. And guess what happened after that? A healing. Right after that, a healing took place. Let me show you. Acts chapter 3. Verses 1 through 7 states that Peter and John went into the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth, I want you to underline that, okay? He was lame from birth, was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called Beautiful Gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, He asked them for some money. Now, this is what I noticed as I was reading the scripture. It states that Peter and John looked at him intently. Meaning, this is what I believe, that the Holy Spirit was speaking to them in that moment. They were hearing the voice of the Father speak to them by his spirit. Because look at what Peter said next. It said, and then Peter said, look at us. And the man didn't know what was about to come. He thought, okay, what money you got? Like, what do you have for me? And Peter says, look at us. And Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Can you imagine being there? Like, what did he just say? Does he know? Does Peter know that he's been lame since birth? Does Peter know that this is how he was born? Does Peter know that this is his circumstances? Can God really do something like that? I want you to notice the way Peter speaks here, the way Peter is praying, because he's not saying, God, I, I hope you can, and, and if it's sufficient to your power, can you, can you please rise up? No, he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, walk, because I believe you heard from the Lord. And through extreme faith, do you realize that Peter risked looking stupid in front of everybody? To see a miracle in your life, I'm just telling you, I'm warning you, you have to risk looking stupid. Moving out here to plant this church, we heard over and over again, you're dumb. (laughs) Even today, believing in the power of God and what God can do, you hear it all the time. It doesn't matter what people say. All that matters is what God is speaking over your life, what he's doing in your life right now. And Peter didn't care. He heard from God, so we said, get up and walk. Listen to this, though. Because we missed this part. Peter then took the lame man by the right hand and he helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. I love that Peter had to grab him because maybe this means that this man was sitting there not even knowing he was healed. 
not even knowing that this miracle could be for him. He was staring at them until Peter did what? Until Peter grabbed his right hand. Look at the text. And as soon as he grabbed him and pulled him up, as soon as Peter allowed him to move, then his ankles became strong. Then he was instantly healed. Peter had to make him move to see the miracle. He spoke it over him. He knew what God would do, that he grabbed his hand and said, let me help you up. And watch what God can do. And you know what we say, though, when we read stories like this? Because, and I did this for a long time, too. I'd read stories about the power of God and the supernatural abilities of God and what he could do and what he did for the disciples. And I would say to myself, yeah, that'd be cool. But that was for the disciples. That was back then. God wouldn't do something like that today, but the scripture tells us that God was the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He doesn't change his character. That's what's so good about God. He doesn't change his character on us. He's just not going to wake up one day and be like, hey, you know what? I changed my mind on this forgiveness thing. Okay, I'm not going to forgive you anymore. No. His character is always sufficient. His character will always show you grace and mercy, so it doesn't matter sometimes what your circumstances look like. But we look at stories like this and we say, you know what? But he was a disciple. So let me ask you this question. I really want you to think about this. Did this power come from Peter? Or did this power come from the spirit of God living inside of Peter? This power came from the spirit of God. And Peter, over and over again, the disciples made sure people knew, hey, this is not us that is doing this. But this is the spirit of God living inside of us. And he said in Acts chapter 3, verse 16, through faith in the name of Jesus Christ, that's the reason this man was healed. Not because of me. There's nothing special about me, but it's the spirit of God living inside of me. And the same spirit of God lives inside of you as a believer in Christ. What's your life look like? Do you care? Do you really care? Do you ask God to do something supernatural? Because I'm telling you today, and this is what I heard from the Lord, that so many of us are sitting down, just like this lame man, not receiving the healing that God wants to give us because we're not willing to move. And what I love is this. It says, it's the spirit of God that draws you in. That's what scripture tells us. So you came to Jesus. You gave your life over to Jesus, eternal salvation. And then the spirit of God comes in and says, give me your hand but I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to move. I don't want to do that. That's uncomfortable. I know this. This is my circumstances. And the Holy Spirit grabs you and pulls you up. And it's when you move that you see the healing take place. What I'm asking you is this. What healing is God trying to give you, but you're not believing in it for your own life or your own soul or your mind, right? Because we look at the story too. Let me, let me also show you this because let me ask you this question. Was life perfect for them after this? Right? He just preached. 3,000 people came to Christ. There's healings now. People are noticing this, and, and everybody's talking about it. So was life perfect for them? Was everybody good, and they admired them, and they got a million followers on Instagram all of a sudden? Like, yeah, look at them. No. They became a threat to the enemy. I need you to learn this. When you are led by the Spirit of God, the devil knows. When you are led by the Spirit of God, the devil knows that now everywhere you go, there will be power and authority from God to not only change you, but change everybody around you. And it changes everything. So what happened? They started to persecute them. They started to say, hey, don't you talk about Jesus. Otherwise, you're going to prison. We'll take you out. And that's exactly what happened to them. I'm telling you right now, being led by the Spirit, people will make fun of you. You will see mean, nasty comments online, okay? People will talk about how dumb you are. Let me, let me also give you some freedom. You don't have to reply back. Hallelujah, come on. You don't have to prove your point. Let God prove it. Because when God proves it, then they see the power of God, they may change. But when we try to prove it, usually, it's to defend ourselves. We get sarcastic, right? And we say something that we wish we didn't say. So allow God to prove it. You may even have family members leave you and hurt you and say, I can't believe that you're doing this, that, you, that you're following God. So what do you do? Do you just hide? Not say anything, not offend anybody anymore? What do you do? Look at the story here. After this happened, they were thrown into prison, but then they were released. And immediately after, after they just said, hey, don't preach about Jesus anymore, they get together and they start to pray for more boldness. 
hey, God, I just went to prison. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Now help me to preach even more bolder. Would you pray a prayer like that? Be honest. You just went to prison for Jesus. Would you get out and immediately be like, I'm ready to go again? (laughs) <laughs> Come on, Holy Spirit. And I love this because here's what happened. The world will know the explosive power of the Spirit of God. Acts chapter 4, verse 29 and 30 says it like this. And now, this is their prayer. They said, oh, now, and now, oh, Lord, hear their threats. Hear what they're saying about me. Hear how they're coming against me. Hear about the names that they're calling me. And God, give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Underline the next sentence. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done. Through the name of your holy servant, Jesus, after this prayer, the meeting place shook. The foundations shook. I believe the demons were rebuked. The enemy was pushed back. The people would know the spirit of God is there. And it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit when they preached the word of God with great boldness. What did they ask for? They asked to preach the word of God with boldness and they asked for God to stretch out his hand for healing and miraculous things to happen. I'm telling you, this should change your life and change your relationship with God. But here's also what I noticed because again, This is kind of how I grew up. When I speak about the subject of healing, sometimes we're like, oh no, (laughs) where's this going? What kind of church is this? What what is the pastor about to do? What's he about to say? Is he about to do something crazy? Is he about to bring some snakes from the back and do something insane? Let me tell you right now, if snakes come from back there, I'm leaving with you, okay? This is not that type of church (laughs) at all. Okay, don't worry about that. What are we though? We are a Bible believing church. And I'm telling you right now, everything that I say, I will back it up by scripture, by scripture, by scripture and scripture. Okay. That's why I drive them crazy back there. I give them like 50 scriptures every Sunday, but I'm doing this because the Bible makes one thing very clear. We serve a supernatural God that is not limited by the natural world that we live in. I love the story of Abraham and Sarah, because if you know the story, you know that Sarah laughed at the idea that she could have a child in her old age. Yet God spoke it, didn't he? He promised that over her, promised that for their family because that was going to cause an inheritance that would bless the entire earth. All the Israelites would be blessed through Abraham and his faith. But what did she do? She laughed due to her circumstances because she didn't see the miracle, yet it didn't happen in her timing. How many times do we walk away because it's not happening in our timing, right? Listen to this. So God shows up and he he says this to Abraham. And I love how he says it. Genesis chapter 18, verse 13 and 14. God says, hey, Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? What would you say as a husband? Think about it. Like, oh, oh, uh, why did she laugh? Um, I don't know. She saw something funny. No, no. And God answers it for him. He said, why did she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? And he said, is anything too hard for the Lord? And as I was studying this yesterday, that one line, that one verse took me back. I'm going to be honest with you. And I wanted to repent because there have been so many times in my life that I've, I've seen the big vision from God and the miracles that he can do. But I feel like sometimes doubt just holds me back. And I read that realizing, God, nothing is too hard for you. Truly, nothing is too hard for you. You have created all things. You can make mountains move. You can part a Red Sea. You can take down giants. Nothing in my life is too hard for you. And the same is for you. Nothing that you're facing right now is too hard for God to bring a miracle into that situation or to bring healing. And it may not be the healing you thought it would be. Maybe it's different in a different way, but I promise you, the glory of God will always be seen in the end. But he said, is anything too hard for the Lord? And then God said this, by the way, I'll return next year and Sarah will have a son. I'll be back and Sarah will have a child. What miracle of healing is God wanting to give you, but you're laughing at the idea because it seems impossible. Maybe it's to heal a broken heart because of a bad relationship 
something you were invested in and you never thought it would come to this, and it did. And now you feel lost and heartbroken and you're asking God, why? Why did it have to happen like this? Maybe it's to heal your broken body. You've always been healthy. You've always done the right things and ate the wrong, right things. And then all of a sudden, this things start happening with your body and you feel like you've lost control. And you feel like you're not who you used to be. Or maybe it's to heal broken faith. Or maybe it's to heal a broken identity, how you see yourself. But here's what I notice: So many of us are complaining or divided about the topic of healing that we miss what the Holy Spirit came to do. And here's what I want to teach you today. The Holy Spirit came to bring healing into your life in three ways, okay? The Holy Spirit came to bring healing upon you, in you, and through you. The Holy Spirit came to bring healing upon you, upon your body, in you, for your soul, and through you. By faith, praying for other people, seeing the supernatural healings, miracles of God, right? This should be our walk with Christ. Listen to this. I love this. And this was what Jesus came to do. Psalms chapter 103, verse 2 and 3. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all of your iniquities, who heals all of your diseases. I want you to notice here. Bless the Lord, O my soul, emotional healing. Forgives of your iniquities. This is salvation. Forgiveness of sins. Healing of your past mistakes. You understand that salvation is a miracle of God, of his grace given to you. There's nothing that we have done to earn it. We just believe in what Jesus has done. We allow him into our life. And because of that, there's healing, right, that happens when you give your life over to Christ. I'm no longer who I used to be. That's what this is stating. But also, guess what Jesus took upon the cross and who heals all of your diseases? Physical healing. So right here, we see emotional healing. We see salvation and we see physical healing. Each health is brought to you by the power of the Holy Spirit by believing in Jesus. Listen, to recover the damage the world and sin has placed upon you. So the title of today's message is this. Title net level three, recover the health bar. Okay, level three, recover the health bar. And I'm going to explain what that means in a second. All right, but I want to show you two powerful points today. Point number one is this. The Holy Spirit came to heal the brokenhearted and the oppressed. Hallelujah, good news, right? The Holy Spirit came to heal the brokenhearted and the oppressed. Whenever you play a game, I was thinking about this. And again, I've called this series Level Up and we're playing with some game uh, visuals. But whenever you play a game, at the top of the screen, usually you're going to see a health bar. Go ahead and put that on the screen too. What does the health bar represent? The health bar represents just how much damage you can take before you're done, right? And you know that if you're a gamer, if you play a lot of games and you're fighting or doing whatever, maybe it's Mario, you can only go as long as you have some health. And eventually you have to find something or some health in the game to, to recover that health as well. Otherwise, the game over. That's how a lot of us are living. I started to think about this, that a lot of us right now, we are on E when it comes to our faith and what God can do in our life. We feel, listen, so many of us today, even coming to church on a Sunday, feel spiritually dead, completely gone, have nothing left to give, seeing no miracles, seeing no supernatural things of God because we're not moving by faith because we feel like we're too gone or too lost in our situation, meaning we're too broken. And if there was anybody that knew how that felt, it was the Canaanite woman that came to Jesus and she begged Jesus, please heal my daughter of demon possession. I want to show you this powerful story today. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 15 now. Matthew chapter 15, and this story can be hard to understand, so I want to break it down to you because it's very powerful. But let me give you some background first. Jesus just traveled away from the crowds. He's gotten away from the Pharisees. He's with the disciples, and he's going to the district of Tyre and Sidon, okay, which is Gentile territory. And I believe the disciples are traveling with him thinking, okay, nobody's going to bother us here. Like the Pharisees can't attack us. They're not going to be in this territory. They don't want to be around the Gentiles. People are going to come up to us because they don't believe in God, right? They believe in other things. They're pagan. And so there's no way that anything's going to happen. This will be a great vacation. This will be a great time of rest. And what happened? Immediately as they get there, it says a Canaanite woman came up to Jesus and begged for a healing over her daughter. Now notice this. Matthew calls her the Canaanite woman for a purpose to show you that she comes from a culture that does not follow God. 
that is very rebellious against God. Not only that, he wants to make a statement that the Jews, okay, would never associate with a Gentile woman. Meaning the disciples, the Jews, the Pharisees, none of them would ever talk to a woman like this in this pagan land. So here's what she did. Matthew chapter 15, verse 22 and 23 says, a Gentile Canaanite woman who lived there came to him, to Jesus, pleading, have mercy on me. I love this. O Lord, son of David. By her calling him son of David, she is admitting right there she believes he's the Messiah. Right there. Even before many of the Jews or even the disciples understood this fully. She calls him the son of David, Messiah. For my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. And here's what Jesus did. It seems unusual. I'm going to explain why he did this, okay? But it actually says Jesus gave her no reply, which is very unlike Jesus. Usually he would have some comforting words or he would be able to teach and, and show some, um, a moment that would change their life, but he didn't say anything. Look at what the scripture says. But Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. Then the disciples urged him to send her away. Here's what the disciples says. Tell her to go away for she is bothering us with all her begging. This doesn't seem like the stories we usually read, right? This is not usually how it goes down. Why would Jesus not say anything? And why are the disciples being so harsh? Ooh, here's the aha moment. You ready for this? Jesus didn't say anything so that the hearts of the disciples would speak up. And at that moment, the disciples spoke what was in their heart that Jesus had to show them to change for the future. Because I'm telling you right now, according to their customs and their culture and the law of Moses, they would never associate with a Gentile woman like this. But God was going to transform them and change them where they would bring the gospel all over the world, even to Gentiles. But something had to change on the inside. You understand? So right before this happened, here's how I know this. Right before this happened, what is the last lesson that Jesus taught the disciples? It's found in Matthew chapter 15, verse 18. And he said, but your words you speak come from the heart. That's what defiles you. And so in this moment, right after preaching that, Jesus is like, all right, let's put it to practice. I won't say anything. What are you going to say? And what did they say? They said, get rid of her. She's bothering us. But listen, here's, let's continue the story because it gets really good. Jesus finally speaks, but still it's not his normal encouraging words. He says this, Matthew chapter 15, verse 24 through 27. Then Jesus said to the woman, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. But she came and she worshiped him. So she's already called him the Messiah. She's worshiping him. Okay, and she's pleading again, Lord, help me. And Jesus responded, it isn't right to take food from the children, talking about the children of Israel, and throw it to the dogs, the Gentiles, all right? And then she replied, that's true, Lord, but even dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall beneath the master's table. Why did Jesus speak like this? Think about it. Why did he speak in such a way? And recently I've seen this topic come up online and people are trying to accuse Jesus of calling her a dog. They even said that he was racist, that he repented in this moment and that he healed her. That's not what happened. The reason Jesus stated out loud the term dog is because this is what the Pharisees were teaching according to the law of Moses. And let me show you what the Pharisees were teaching. Exodus chapter 22, verse 31. God said, you must be a holy, my holy people. Okay, I'm setting you apart to be holy. Therefore, do not eat any animal that has been torn apart and killed by wild animals. Throw it to the dogs. And the reason why God was so particular about what they ate is because they had to be strong and live long to live through the wilderness. Okay, to get through the wilderness to the promised land. But the Pharisees also took Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 21. And they said this which states, you must not eat anything that has died a natural death. You may give it, though, to a foreigner living in your town. So the Pharisees were teaching, listen, you can't eat these things, throw it to the dogs. Dogs represent foreigners, the Gentiles. And so they would call anybody that wasn't a Jew a dog. And then that also made them believe, well, if they're not living for God, they're definitely living in sin, which they were. But they were also living in foolishness because Proverbs chapter 26, verse 11 says it like this, as a dog returns to his vomit... So a fool repeats his foolishness. I want you to see something really powerful here, okay? 
There's a lot of context that goes with this story. The woman wasn't offended. Notice how she speaks. Lord, even the dogs get crumbs. She wasn't offended over what he was speaking because he was speaking according to the law of Moses, getting the attention of the disciples. She knew where she was in life. This is powerful. She knew that she was in sin. She knew the way she had been living. She knew that she was brokenhearted and hurt and needed mercy. She knew that her own daughter was oppressed by a demon. She knew there were open doors in her life that needed to be closed and healed. She recognized where she was. She wasn't offended. And she said, God, take all of me. I need you. I'll take the crumbs. Every bit that you have to offer, God, I will take it if it means that my daughter is healed and I'm forgiven. What a blessed statement she made here. Because Jesus taught this on the Sermon on the Mount. I want you to hear this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit. What does that mean? It means spiritually poor. You're in a place in life where you are begging for mercy. If you do not receive that mercy, you will die. Recognizing what is in your life and how you badly need the grace of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed is this woman in a Gentile territory coming up to Jesus, calling him the son of God, the Messiah, willing to take crumbs to see her life changed. And guess what? At this moment, Jesus is so cool. He proved a major point that changed everybody, okay? Because I wonder if the disciples remembered what Jesus said back in Matthew 11. Let me put it all together. Just follow with me. Matthew 11, verse 20 and 21. When Jesus was in these cities that most of the Jews occupied, he began to rebuke the cities in which most of the high mighty works have been done because they did not repent. And he said, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works were done in you, which were done in you, have been done where? Tyre and Sidon, the Gentile land, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth ashes. Jesus is about to heal this woman right now in the district of Tyre and Sidon, yet in the cities of the Jews, instead of believing in the miracles of God, instead of repenting and calling him the Messiah and believing he was the one true God, the son of God, instead, they put out rumors and they said John the Baptist was possessed by demons and they said Jesus was a drunkard and a glutton. That's what they said. And Jesus was saying, listen, I have performed so many miracles before your eyes. The Pharisees never believed. They didn't care. They didn't care. Every time they saw a miracle, what did they do? They conspired to either kill him or trick him. There are some people that say, you know what? If I just saw a miracle of God, did I believe it? No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. Because you have to fall in love with God. You have to know God's character. You have to truly know him in an intimate way and hear his voice for those miracles to truly mean something to you because you can see a miracle every day and not care without the presence of God in your life. And so this is what Jesus is saying. I love how he said that. And then here they are and it's being fulfilled. And this woman came up to Jesus calling him the Messiah from the very beginning. And he brought healing not only upon her daughter, but her identity, her soul right here. Matthew chapter 15, verse 28. Then Jesus answered her, woman, your faith, your personal trust and confidence in my power is great. It will be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at that moment. And so let's say this is a physical health bar, right? A lot of us right now, we're on straight empty. You got nothing left to give. You're brokenhearted. What people have called you, the names that they've called you, stay rent-free in the back of your head. Every time you look in the mirror, this is your identity. You feel broken. You feel lost. You have a hard time trusting people anymore, especially how can you trust the church, right? How can you keep going to church and moving closer to God? And then for some of us, we're oppressed. Even though we proclaim Jesus, we're oppressed by addictions that are in our life or things that you have prayed over and over again. God, can you just free me from this? Can, I, can you get me out of this, God? How am I going to get out of this? What should I do? What things can I write down that can set me free? 
We missed the whole thing. Jesus brought us salvation. And he said, I'll give you rest. But Jesus said, also, I have a promise for you. You want to hear the promise? If you need healing today, John chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the comforter, the advocate, the intercessor, the counselor, the strengthener, the standby will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him the Holy Spirit to you to be close in fellowship with you. Close fellowship with the Lord because of the Spirit of God filling you. A lot of us are dry. So Jesus said, let the Holy Spirit fill you. Did you know that the Holy Spirit grieves for you? He grieves when you're living in sin because he knows what it's doing to you. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 through 32. I don't have time to read these scriptures, but they'll be on the stage or the screen. The Holy Spirit also brings conviction into your life. And he helps bring conviction so that you run to Jesus and know the things that you need to turn away from and repent from so that you can be completely saved. Also, the Holy Spirit comes into your life and fills you and says, you know what? You're not alone to take on these addictions or these problems. I will help you overcome your flesh. In fact, the Holy Spirit will overflow out of you. Romans chapter 8, verse 12 and 13, you are not controlled by your addictions anymore. Because of you? No. Because the Spirit of God has recovered your health bar has recovered your health has strengthened you to do the things that you cannot do on your own and what i love about this also the greek word dunamis also means this excellent of soul which means that the holy spirit came to heal your soul and the spirit of god searches deep within you and even reveals to you the things that you don't know about yourself the holy spirit prays for you when you pray, the Holy Spirit yearns and prays specific things over your life that you need that you don't even know that you need. He searches your heart. There's holes in a lot of our hearts, broken on the inside. The Holy Spirit will fill them and change you and heal you. But again, you have to desire a relationship with the Spirit of God. He's not going to force it on you. He's not going to force this relationship on you. But my last point is this that I want to share with you. The Holy Spirit also came to heal physically and spiritually as well. The Holy Spirit came to heal physically and spiritually. Peter gained a reputation due to the miraculous physical healings by the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 5, verse 14 and 15 amazes me every time I read it. But it states, more than ever, believers were added to the Lord so that they carried out the sick. Oh, I'm sorry, multitudes of both men and women. And they carried out the sick into the streets. Listen to this. And laid them on cots and mats that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. They believed and yearned so much for the power of God. They waited for Peter to walk by. I don't even have to talk to Peter. I don't have to touch him, nothing. Let me just get in his shadow. Let me just be near him. Again, it wasn't Peter. It was the Spirit of God living inside of him. You have to desire to move by faith. And they did this. And the people also gathered from towns and around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits. And guess what? They were all healed. And these physical healings were taking place. Amazing. Oh, but I love how God works because... God reminded something in Peter that still needed to be healed in his heart. Something that reminded him of the time with Jesus, with the Canaanite woman, or maybe Jesus with the Samaritan woman at the well. But listen to this, in Acts chapter 10, we get this story where Peter goes on the rooftop to pray. Again, it's 3 p.m. And I thought that's interesting because um, we see in our culture today that they say the witching hour is 3 a.m. The enemy is always trying to mock God. That's what it is you see that they prayed at 3 p.m. So he goes up on the rooftop to pray. And as he's praying, he gets distracted by his hunger. And I love this because God uses his hunger to teach him a lesson. So let that be a warning to you guys, okay? If you're hungry while I'm preaching, God may get you, okay? With your hunger, it's all right. But no, he's, he sees his vision now. And look what God shows him. Acts chapter 10, verses 11 through 16. He saw the heavens opened in something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. 
And then there came a voice to him. God said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. What Peter was saying, what God showed him were the things that were specifically not for them to eat according to the law of Moses. So Peter was saying, God, no, I've never eaten anything that is forbidden according to the law of Moses. But then God shows up because Peter had a problem with telling God no. How many times did Peter tell Jesus no? No, Lord, they won't get you. They won't take you to the cross. I'll stand in front of you. Don't you worry. And Jesus said, I rebuke you, Satan. Get out of the way. Right? Even in this instance, God is telling him, don't you dare tell me what is unclean if I have made it clean, if I have saved what you cannot. Some things in your heart, Peter, I'm telling you right now, you're going to present the gospel to people you never thought you would and places you never thought you would go with people you thought were deserted, alone, and rebellious, and never will be used by God. Oh, Peter, you're about to see that I'm going to use you to bring salvation to them. The same is for you. The Spirit of God is not only bringing physical healings into your life, but He's bringing salvation, this healing of salvation through you, with people you don't even like, with people you don't even want to talk to, with people you don't even want to see. God will do it. God said this. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. And this happened three times. Three representing holiness because of the Holy Trinity, but also three times to gain his attention. Peter, this is very important. You need to listen right now. And then immediately after that, Peter received a word of knowledge. Acts 10 verse 19 and 20 says, and while Peter was pondering the vision, he didn't understand it yet. The Spirit said to them, the Holy Spirit spoke and said, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation. I have sent them. Why did God say it so clearly? Because immediately when he went down and opened the door, guess who he saw? He saw Roman soldiers who wanted to take him to a Roman officer who wanted to hear about Jesus. God said, don't, don't tell them no. Don't walk away. Through you, I've caused physical healings. But now I'm healing your heart. And you're going to heal them through salvation by telling them about Jesus. And we just see the Holy Spirit bringing healing of all kinds over and over and over again. A broken woman, her daughter's healed, her identity's healed. In this moment, God is healing his heart and using him to heal people he never would have talked to before. There was a time uh, when I was a youth pastor and there were two boys that were friends and one of them wasn't a believer or he was on the fence. He just felt like he couldn't hear God. He didn't know what God was gonna do in his life. He just kind of was living for himself completely. But his friend playing baseball broke his arm. And one day I remember right before service, right before I preached, I just felt the Holy Spirit speak to me and say, grab him who's an unbeliever. Tell him to put his hands on his friend and you pray with him and pray for healing right now. And okay, God, I said, hey, come here. And he puts his hands on his friend. Again, he's not a believer. And I put my hands on his friend and I start praying in the name of Jesus, be healed. But what God has for you is good. And I'll be honest with you, in that moment afterwards, I was kind of like, anything happened? <laughs> anything? Nothing happened. i be honest, nothing happened. But I said, okay, God, well, it's in your hands. You told me to do it. I don't have to understand. Just be an obedient. Nothing happened that night. Three days later, I'm about to preach a chapel service to about 700 students. This student gets up and says, Pastor, I got to tell you something. He goes, you'll never believe this. My arm is completely healed. He said, I went to the doctor. This is a true story. My wife is over there. She knows. He went to the doctor and the doctor was so confused and said, your arm is completely healed. You no longer need surgery that was scheduled for that week. What did this do to his friend? His friend couldn't believe this. This is amazing. Can God really heal? Can God show up? And what I've seen throughout the scriptures is a lot of time when God heals, it's for evangelistic reasons. You understand that? Right? It's just not to just make us look good, but God is actually pulling people near him. You've been lame since birth. You've been blind since birth. Let me heal you and show you what man cannot do, but God can. 
and it brought people to salvation. Every time they were healed, they were joyful in the Lord because they knew what it was like to be broken. They knew what it was like to be alone and completely hurt and have nobody there. Can God always heal? Yeah, he can. Does he always heal? No. It's according to his will, and only God knows. And even out of the scriptures, we see amazing healings, and then we see some that didn't get healed. Timothy had a continuous stomach problem. God didn't heal him. Paul had a thorn in his flesh. And God said, I will not remove it because it keeps you humble. In fact, there was a friend of Paul's that had to be left behind because he was ill and almost died. He was saved, but he wasn't able to continue the journey. Yet these same men were able to heal so many for the gospel. And so here's what I've learned. I know that he can. And I know when he speaks, just be obedient. But if the healing doesn't happen the way you think it should, trust what God is doing. Because sometimes what's more important than the healing of the physical body is the healing of the heart and soul on the inside. Because that leads to eternal salvation. Okay? Because listen, even if God healed your physical body today, you're still going to die. It's still going to happen. So God knows exactly what you need. He knows what miracle you need to receive. And the best way I've ever heard it stated is is like this. Let me ask you this question. Did Jesus die for your sins upon the cross? Yes. But do we still sin? Do we still live in a fallen world where there's sin? Yes. But Jesus took that upon the cross. The scripture also tells us, Matthew chapter 8 verse 17, he took our illness and bore our diseases upon the cross as well. So did he take our sickness upon the cross? Yes. But is there still sickness in this world? Yes. Why? Because we live in a fallen world. The Bible never promised perfect health in this life, but it does in the next life. And that's where we're going. Yes, God can intervene and do the supernatural today, but ultimately we will all have a new heavenly body. We'll all be in one place before the presence of the Lord, a new heaven, a new earth, eating from the tree of life. Oh, it's gonna be good. We'll never die, we'll never be sick. We'll never cry, we'll never mourn, we'll never be sad. We won't have depression and anxiety and all these things that weigh us down. This is the promise for your life. And I love this, because Jesus got mad at death. When he went to go see Lazarus, the scripture says it like his, he snorted in his spirit, almost like a grunt, why? Because he became mad at death. This that came into the world that was never meant to be in the beginning. It's not what God created for us. This pain that is brought into our life. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 26 says it like this. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Death will be no more. All of it will be gone. Your health bar, your health bar will never be low again. The Spirit of God lives in you. I'm going to have you stand right here. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come up front. And we're going to do something bolder today. I want you to be honest with yourself right now. Do you need healing? Do you need healing? Listen, do you need healing over your body? Do you need healing over your mind? Do you need healing over your soul? Do you need healing over your broken heart? Do you need healing over your identity? All of us, I'm telling you, all of us right now, we need some type of healing. And the Holy Spirit came to show you dunamis power of healing today. But listen, maybe right now the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and saying, take my hand so that I can move you towards the miracle that God wants to show you. Because he loves you. He always has never leave you, will never forsake you, but you will, will you move and receive that healing today. Whatever it is, you can come up front, you can pray over your seats right now. I'm going to worship. Hey guys, this is Pastor Bobby Chandler, and I just want to say thank you so much for watching today's message. We pray that it blessed your life, but do me a favor, before you just click off of YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our channel, and also ring that bell so that you get notifications on the next sermon or any announcements that we have going on. I also want to say thank you for being a faithful partner with Authentic Church, because of your giving, we are able to bless and impact the people around us every single week. 
So we love our Authentic family and thank you today for joining us.